Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Navid Isak, and today I will be sharing my experiences about using the uh, Denby Cloud for a recent uh, hackathon that I organized to look into some spatial transcriptomics data. Before we get into it, I wanted to give a brief overview about transcriptomics and how this has been changing over the last few years. So indeed, we've been going through a resolution revolution with regards to how we profile gene expression in tissues. So to give you a cartoon example of this, um, we'll go to one of the prototypic um, organs that is used to analyze gene expression, the brain. So over here, we have a, a cartoonish representation of, of the different tissue niches that would be containing different cell type compositions within the brain. Traditionally, we've been using bulk uh, sequencing omics um, to profile these tissues. Um, by and large, actually, this technology is sufficient to actually answer um, many, que many questions um, as so long as the gene expression differences are occurring in um, a large number of cell types or if the gene expression changes are very, very large. In the last decade, we've seen the rise of single cell gene expression profiling um, where we can actually profile each and every set cell in the tissue. Uh, and this allows us to stratify cellular populations, um, which then give us the opportunity to actually identify changes at the cell type specific level. And this can be particularly powerful for the identification of, of gene expression changes within rare cell populations. However, in the last few years, we've seen the rise of spatial transcriptomics methodologies. So these uh, capture gene expression um, of cells, but also retain their spatial information. So this allows you to look both into how compositions within spatial niches are changing, and also any gene expression changes uh, associated with, with whatever phenotype you would like to look into. So the spatially resolved transcriptomics is, is booming. It was uh, awarded Nature Method of the Year, uh, a few years ago, back in 2020. And we've also seen a, a massive rise in the number of uh, spatial omics technologies over the last few years. In particular, in the last two or three years, we're seeing a doubling of the methodologies that are available to generate spatial omics data. So while the number of technologies is increasing, they're built upon um, what we can classify as four core types of uh, technologies. The, um, the oldest of those technologies is microdissection based um, spatial uh, omics analysis. So this is where you would either cut or um, uh, use a laser to isolate cells or small tissue areas, um, which then you can subsequently follow up with gene expression profiling. So you would get the gene expression profiles and you would be able to map back those gene expression data to where they were isolated in the tissue. Um, the next two, in-situ hybridization and in-situ sequencing, actually take imaging-based approaches to localize individual mRNA. So you really get down to this kind of nanometer range of identifying precisely where this expression was. And this is usually much, this is much lower than the cell level resolution. So you're really looking at subsetting. And then the most popular mm -hmm. group of technologies, the fourth point is there's some in-situ capture where you have some sort of plate with some beads that have been plated onto it. And these are barcoded in a way you retain their spatial information of where these where these kind of beads came from. And then the tissue is placed on these beads and perform a reaction to actually uh, um, capture these molecules and barcode them. Um, so then after sequencing, you can figure out, okay, you sequenced a particular mRNA at this location in your kind of plate array. So whilst we kind of have these four broad categories of technologies, the actual number of adaptations of these technologies is huge. And you're probably familiar with some of these, such as EEL, Hibis, Dharma, Secfish. But I think for, for, for normal researchers, right, we have this the, the, these different tiers of these technologies. There's that brand new Nature Biotech publication, which is on mouse brain, produce some data, which is better than all of the other data that's existed before. Um, and not many people can actually make use of that. And then you have technologies that begin to mature, and that you have labs introducing their own homebrew equivalents of these, and you start seeing data. But I think one core thing for actually maybe in training purposes is actually focusing on at what point do they start becoming commercially available. So actually with sequencing, it was this change from having your homebrew sequencing to 
an Illumina sequencer, which meant for actually very little money and in a robust way being able to get results that allows people to generate data at mass. And this is the point where training actually becomes very effective and efficient. And we're beginning to see this now. So we have technologies such as Visium and GeoMX that have been out for a while. These have been based in kind of primarily in situ capture methods or LCM. But now we're getting a few of these kind of high resolution methods, such as uh, in situ hybridization and in situ sequencing via technologies such as Xenium, Resolve, Cosmix, VisGen. It's probably outdated. I have the dot dot dots because every time I present, I'm always I'm always three new technologies out. And actually, in this field, we're becoming super exciting. I mean, everything I focus on is spatial transcriptomics because this is where the majority of data is available. But we're now also seeing a lot of very spatial proteomics uh, coming through, and also multi true spatial multimodes, really combining RNA and other readouts uh, in the same cell in the same tissue. So um, I also had like a slide on some of the challenges we're facing in the spatial domain. I didn't want to go too specific into the into the biology and the technical aspects because these are changing really rapidly. I think the biggest consideration here is nearly every single cell problem is also a spatial problem. We inherit all of those. Given that we're dealing with new technologies that actually represent this data in a different way, um, we need to kind of focus on establishing guidelines for those early pre-processing steps. In spatial, we actually got to a very good set of software tools for analysis very quickly just migrated everything that was single cell to spatial <laughs> and assumed that the first part was correct, assumed that the assignment of molecules to cell works. And as long as that assumption is held, a lot of the downstream stuff works pretty well. But we're still lacking a lot of um, these, 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 these guidelines on early steps. So with deconvolution of like data sets like Visium, where you have no resolution and each readout is multiple cells, we're kind of getting there. In the last years, there have been like two really good benchmarking papers. But when it comes to segmentation, there's nothing really there right now. Um, there are these additional things of dealing with sparsity, which is, I think, probably a little worse in the single cell field right now. In, I mean, worse in spatial compared to single cell. Um, and there's also this other kind of thing of spatial noise and spatial artifacts. Like one of the things that we typically find is in these imaging-based methods, you don't image the entire tissue. You have to look at tiles at a time and then computationally stitch them together. And in around 15% of data sets, the, the timing isn't done correctly. And there's an overlap of like a couple of micrometers. So in between each image, you have double the density of molecules because of incorrect stitching. So these are all subtle issues that kind of are, are kind of known, but they're not really addressed in these kind of analysis workflows. So normalization is a bit of an issue with these kind of more high throughput technologies, which are like, like Visium, which profile all genes, you can still use traditional normalization as like compared to all of your molecules. But with these targeted assays where you look at 100 genes, you typically don't have enough signal readout to form library size normalization. People have talked about normalizing to the size of the cell. Um, but again, there's no clear definition of what to do here. In terms of analysis, a lot of the single stuff uh, um, uh, analysis methodologies really do apply and they work really well and they're quite fantastic. I still feel like we're missing a lot of this kind of spatial element in the modeling part of it. So it's usually taken in as a point afterwards where you have the context for it. Um, but having, for example, a cell typing algorithm that also considers your spatial embedding would be super useful. And also just generating new and novel spatial uh, methods. So I mean, we've I think a lot of the standard ones have been implemented, but one of the amazing things for me for like single cell was so much effort and energy went into defining all of these new algorithms, it, it exposed me to a whole set of data science that I never considered. Before single cell, for me, optimal clustering was performed by um, HDB scan, right? <laughs> and this was kind of the method. You couldn't beat this. K-means was always like, okay, we don't touch it. But then from single cell, you have a much larger dimensionality of data and different uh, ways of modeling these 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 interactions, and I'm hoping that the, the spatial field also kicks up something new and brings about kind of this more subtle knowledge about kind of spatial metrics and spatial methodologies that can really be used. And we also have a number of practical aspects. I think these are probably all inherited single cell problems as well in terms of data, where to get it, 
how to store it, where to put it, how do we maintain provenance of where this data came from at the tissue level and the data level. Um, compute resources, especially for the early pre-processing, especially like image analysis really does require a lot of resources. And also, as, as I said before, like since this is really cutting edge, we don't have so much training material. There are probably only a handful of courses worldwide that actually are training spatial. Mm -hmm. um, and of those, they're probably going through their first, perhaps their second iteration of training. All right, so that's my very brief introduction on where we are with spatial with regards to technology, technology implementations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, hackathon, which we called Space Hack. So this was focusing on a very simple concept of trying to define what is a cell. So with single cell technologies, especially single cell RNA sequencing, the whole reaction is based around processing an individual cell. Whereas the spatial technologies is a little bit agnostic. So the capture method is either based on imaging or you have these arrays. So you can have multiple cells within an array or with these imaging based techniques, you see where the molecules are in a cell, but you have to define a strategy which says this circle is the cell. And traditionally, the approaches we've taken are very naive, and they don't address this very well. I'm not going to go into the science behind this. I'm going to focus more on the technical aspects of actually how we made this workshop happen. Before I get into that, I'm going to do some quick acknowledgments. Um, so this particular hackathon ended up having 63 participants, um, which were roughly one third in person, two thirds online, um, which made it very challenging because we were planning for 15. It meant on the day, or I think three days before the workshop, uh, we had to completely change our strategy of how we actually tried to address it. Uh, it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, I really need to thank the Elixir Germany cloud team, which helped with the back end. And we had a number of organizers for the event, including Paolo. Uh, and this is really for a lot of like the data wrangling uh, and organizing talks and, and whatnot. So this is also a couple of weeks of work. We managed to get like uh, six data sets wrangled, and I think. This is not something that's small. It's really quite a lot of that. So in terms of the technical setup for this hackathon, um, a lot of the things we use are fairly standard. So we set up the website using GitHub pages. Um, and then all of the organizers were part of this GitHub uh, uh, setup. So actually anyone could change it, add their own material. So we had like a nice timetable with links to talks. Um, we managed the code via GitHub as, as most people are doing now. Um, where we had nine repositories with different uh, types of the projects. Uh, we did the kind of low down communication on Slack. We ended up having 29 channels. Not all of them were used. I think primarily around 10 channels were being used. Um, and then we had like the technical setup. So this was based around the Denby Cloud. So Denby stands for German Network Bioinformatics. This is somehow Elixir Germany, somehow also not Elixir Germany, very complicated. Um, but it's our national cloud setup. And uh, that was like the bare metal backend and the actual kind of interfacing to the users was presented by a Jupyter Hub. So how did I set this up? It was actually not so hard. Um, I have to say like I'm a cloud novice. I migrated from my days of actually doing bioinformatics to a group leader with my last tool being developed in Perl. Uh, for the younger people in the audience, this is a language that doesn't matter anymore. Um, <laughs> um, but with regards, to, and, and I also left before cloud technologies were really taking off. So I think things like notebooks were really coming through, Condo was a thing, um, but containerization and using cloud was, was not really a mainstay before I became a group leader. Um, but actually the setup was really simple. So you just go to their page or for Denby, you log in with your Elixir username. Uh, you request a new project, which means you describe whether you want a simple VM or an OpenStack backend. Again, I didn't know what these things meant. I just clicked on one of them uh, and then defined my project in terms of how many mm -hmm. machines I'm going to need, how long do I need these machines for, how much storage do I require. And I think, I mean, this is like a base requirement. So you need to know how much these tools you use. Think about the potential use cases, upscale, do you need a GPU? Do you need a couple of GPUs and whatnot? And then after you define your project, it takes a couple of days to get a response. And then after that, uh, you start working with the team that you've been assigned to. So the German National Cloud is separated between 
um, a number of sides because of um, state level federation being very awkward in Germany. But luckily, the people managing the uh, the Berlin Institute and the Denby Cloud are on the same floor as me, so it makes communication very easy. That aside, I mean by email, it's, it's also super easy as well to get things set up. Um, and then we just find something like, okay, what is the environment we want? Standard Jupyter notebook. Let's set up a different, uh, couple of num number of machines based on medium, large machines, and GPUs. And then the technical setup was practically done within a week. And then after this, we registered a domain so people could actually access it. Um, so altogether, this was around two and a half weeks from getting it, actually making the initial request to actually having something up and running, which is reasonably fast. Now, in terms of getting started with this from a user perspective, um, we had to manage all of our authentication by a GitHub organization. So I just created a GitHub organization called Spatial Hackathon. And as soon as you're part of this uh, GitHub organization, you're able to use your GitHub credentials for authentication. I registered a URL for the cloud instance, spacehack.bihealth.org. So this is an institute one that was set up pretty quickly. And then you're presented with this login screen, which allows you to log in with GitHub. You just put in your credentials. And then you're presented with some sort of images to, to spin up. And we just focused on these technical things of medium, large, and high memory machines, with high memory machines being um, around 400, 500 gigabytes of memory. And then a medium machine was around 32 gigabytes. And we also had a couple of uh, GPU machines as well. Mm -hmm. So you just select what you want. And then it takes one to two minutes to spin up a machine and you're presented with a very familiar kind of Jupyter-like interface where you have a menu bar at the top, navigation, navigation pane on the left, and you can spin up whatever type of terminals you want. What was quite nice about this as well was like you have individual user level um, storage spaces. So when you log in, it remembers your username. You can have your private stuff and you can also set up shared volumes. And the shared volumes is quite useful for us because we had these wrangled data sets that we wanted everyone to have access to. Um, and what was also quite nice is it allows for a lot of customization. So if people needed to install custom condo environments, they can be created. There is a, a small terminal uh, thing that you can just set up uh, and create uh, particular condo environments and then export them as, as uh, Jupyter uh, notebook images. Um, what can also be done that we didn't employ was you can create containers um, that can also be uh, selected. So on, on the first page where I said you could pick different types of machine configurations, you can also change those to completely different software stacks as long as they're based on like a Jupyter Hub, uh, Jupyter Notebook data science stack. So anything, if you have your software requirements, you can have those all on a, in a container image. If you have an R, and a Python stack, you can have these as two different images and they're presented to you as two different options when you spin up. Doesn't sound so hard, does it, right? <laughs> um, which is then, yeah, exactly, right? And I, I've done a few courses in the past and, and it's usually never this easy. Something usually goes wrong, but it was actually really not so hard. On the first thing, we had a bit of a problem. So like the Kubernetes backend with, um, kind of uh, orchestrating the machines was somehow decided to put all of the VMs onto one node and not distributing over the 30 nodes we had. But once that was fixed, actually it was pretty smooth. Uh, I put up a testimonial on, on the website. If you click there, that would be great. Fantastic picture, has been totally Photoshopped with me on the front. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I was much younger. <laughs> Um, but it was it was a really nice thing of like, okay, in two and a half to three weeks, I've set up the compute, the base software, user authentication. I think that's pretty efficient. Uh, I wouldn't have anything fast if I tried to do this within my own institute. Sure. Um, I'm saying that there was also like without, it, we weren't without technical issues. So we had 25 participants on site and it was at a, uh, it was not at a university setting, which meant with 25 participants, we killed the local network. So people had to resort to using their mobile phones for their, uh, for their, their, their connections. And they had to be distributed out throughout the, the venue because um, the, to try and get them to a different hotspot. 